for Creamer Media's Polity, I'm Lumgil Ngonfe. Joining me is author Tendai Sitole, here to discuss his latest book, Black X, Liberatory Thought in Hazania. Your book addresses the country's colonial past and the dehumanization of black people. Can you talk about the significance of the letter X in your book's title? The letter X, it is a sign uh, which marks that which is present, that which is absent, and it has many meanings. And I've made it to be an open-ended uh, sign, but uh, specifically, uh, if one thinks about the, the name of the country, which is uh, Azania, it is the name that is regarded as uh, being absent, but it is there. Uh, those like uh, who've been calling hard for this name, for example, uh, the likes of Robert Sobukwe and the founding members of the Pan-Africanist Congress of Azani, uh, they've been calling for this name, which influenced even the Black Consciousness movement of Steve Biko and many others. And also, it relates to something that is important uh, in this country, that the issue of anti-Black racism we regard it as, no, it is not there because 1994 changed everything and uh, we are in non-racialism. But there are still acts of uh, dehumanization that still continue. And even the presence of the remnants of colonialism, they are still here with us. That is why it cannot be something of the past. And can you discuss the significance and implications of the idea to rename South Africa to Azania? The implications, of course, are scary. Indeed, the name can change. Uh, the name should change. Uh, many countries have changed uh, their names. But the thing that should not happen, which for me is uh, scary, is that we should not uh, rename this country while the material and the structural issues have not changed. Uh, for example, the question of anti-black racism, land dispossession, and then exploitation of labor and dehumanization uh, writ large. Because if we can have the name Azania, while things have not uh, changed, it's, it is going to be an insult, uh, as it has happened in many post-colonial situations. And I believe the name Azania is something that must push us. I'm glad that in 1994 that this country was not renamed Azania, so that we know that in its meaning that it means the land uh, of the free, like you know, and then those who are black, right, uh, that they are dispossessed of their land, uh, their humanity, and their labor. So those things they have to be repaired and restored first before we can have uh, this name. So the implications uh, are that which call for a high level of political responsibility, which must be undertaken. And this is something that I would say is necessary and it is imperative. We need some bold political imagination. And we are, we are thankful that uh, there were waves of transformation in the early 90s. Those debates about African Renaissance, they did their task, but it was only in 2011 when the discourse on decolonization uh, started before fees must fall and roads must fall, which the latter which played a very important part in making sure that the political imagination was put into practice and uh, we, we saw sy systemic changes and we need more. Mm. How tenable is it to imagine and reconfigure Azania in a multicultural society? And is it necessary for the proposals mentioned in the book to align with varying public sensibilities? Of course, as we know, South Africa is a polity, which means a politically organized uh, community. That's what uh, the word polity means. That it has to be a, a polity that is proper, which reflects the true nature of this country. For instance, it cannot be that uh, you're having the black majority and then you have a uh, whites, uh, you have other races, they cannot speak even one indigenous language. In this country, if you talk about racism, you are going to be labeled as being obsessed with race, taking the country backward, and not aligning yourself to the spirit of the constitution. But the constitution which does not reflect the reality of this country. We know very well that South Africa that doesn't love black people. We must start there. Under the black government, uh, we've seen black people like being 
uh, killed without any form of accounting. We see how the judicial system work. We see how even the structural violence where the mass death of black people in the everyday life. Look at even cases like uh, Estimane, Marikana. We can, we, can, we can go on and on and on. That we cannot even call this country multicultural at all. In the sense that if it was multicultural, there was supposed to be coexistence. But that does not exist. The apartheid and the colonial spatial planning, it is still in place. The economic infrastructure it is still in place. Yes, you might have uh, some blacks in the boardrooms, but that does not mean fundamental change. I believe that there has to be a whole reconfiguration of everything. If we are going to have systematic change, it has to be fundamental change, not cosmetic change that, oh, we have black management or we have blacks who are living in the suburbs. We know that these very same blacks, they are indebted middle class. We need to understand what is racism. The manner in which your life in general gets eliminated, prohibited by the very idea of the structures that do exist. Like, you know, the, the lifespan of black people is not the same. The salaries are not, are, are not the same. There needs to be the challenge to this liberal consensus, which says to us, oh, we are all free. Even now there is the whole frenzy of the tears of democracy, which I'm finding very, very insulting, like uh, to the memory of those who wanted a South Africa that, uh, that is uh, truly uh, liberated. We are yet uh, to have that outside the confines of the liberal uh, consensus, which tells us, let's forget the past, let's focus on the present and, and the future. But how do we do that? While like, we still have the reality that uh, is still hitting us in a way that is very, very insulting. In the book, you criticize ideologies such as liberalism and Marxism for their inability to grasp the extent of black suffering and dispossession. Why are these specific ideologies unable to do so? Liberalism and Marxism, uh, specifically because they don't want to talk about the question of anti-black racism. It is clear, like, you know, uh, Marxists, they will tell you clearly that, no, it's, it's not about race, it's about class. Or class uh, trumps over race. Or, no, race, it is there, but it's not the overdetermining factor. So you see that in the Marxist underpinning, which, like, South Africa has a rich and a long history of, we know, with the Communist Party of South Africa, uh, CPSA 1921, in the mine strike that happened, it said white workers unite. And uh, th there was a call for workers of the world you unite, but they changed it to suit their own condition. And that tradition of Marxism, it went on, and then the, the, the party changed into the South African Communist Party. And then even in their literature, look at how the issue of race was just minimized. And you come also to 2005, where like we saw the upsurge of social movements, most which became very Marxist in leaning, and they were addressing real material conditions. But the issue of having to center the, the question of race has been something minimal. But you'll understand that because of there was no grammar of uh, black people in those uh, movements, they must speak the language of their masters or the narrative of their masters who are white. Even the idea of black Marxism, it is only existing now and uh, it is even finding its vocal expression. After Fismas Fall, people after having encountered the works of Cedric Robinson, who did a very refined critique of Marxism from the black point of view. People like even Aikwe Ama, when he did a very, very, very uh, beautiful piece in a pamphlet called Presence African in 1985, a piece which, which you cannot even find in the archives now, very, very, very uh, scarce to find, but it is there in the book. With liberalism, we have to go to Steve Pico. Even before him, people like uh, Stokely Kamikail, Aimee Cizé, they've critiqued white liberalism. What white liberalism does, that they act on behalf of black people. They speak on behalf of black people. We are being told, even in the post-1994, because of this is what has triumphed as the ruling ideological uh, framework. And we have to look at, before 1994, we have to look at the work that has been done by the likes of the South African Institute of Race Relations. 
right? The, the colloquiums that they did, the paucity of literature that uh, they've produced on how this country should become. And uh, you are finding that the expression in the current constitution that we are having in this country, right? And the very same constitution which we need to critique, why are we not thinking about the 1993 constitution which was clear on the question of uh, reparations? And we know that uh, liberalism, in short, it says the individual is prior to society, it's about meritocracy and, and stuff. And the ruling party bought into that because it's a very seductive and dazzling ideology you can easily identify with it because it speaks to things that you believe in but we know how liberalism has nothing to do with uh, the question of anti-black racism that is why like if you look at even the the, the founding principles of black consciousness because uh, the likes of these people they believed in liberalism before they changed what happened after that? When they saw what liberals uh, uh, did to them, they did black consciousness. And people like Alan Payton, they were even uh, against black people thinking for themselves. So we know how paternalistic uh, liberalism is, that you will not be allowed as a black person to speak from the black point of view. So this is a kind of critique that I'm fashioning here. And even our constitution, with its because we know that the regime that uh, people are celebrating today, it is called liberal constitutional democracy. 1994, that's what uh, we have triumphed. It's a freedom for all. And then even the Freedom Charter, it is based on those values. Can you discuss the significance of land dispossession in this country and its existential connection to black life? What type of response does the book offer to the often debated land question? including in an increasingly urbanized society? I wouldn't uh, dichotomize the geographical habitation in terms of urban and rural, because like we know that the questions of land dispossession, they are very, 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 very uh, serious. And we should look, look into the past, the kind of legislations that were imposed. But then the thing that I'm bringing up in the book you know, like the, the question of land, I, I would regard it as a catastrophe, right? It, it's, a, it's a catastrophe, the existential crisis par excellence, in a sense that uh, I'm bringing the, the question of being land in terms of black life. By this, I mean here is the life that has been dispossessed of land, and this does not start in 1913. I think we need to abandon it. The question of land must start from 1652. We must start there. And uh, this date is very significant in order to understand the wars and the violations and the legislations that came to dispossess uh, the issue of land and how even the question of black urbanization cannot be delinked from the destruction of the black family unit in the rural areas. We know that there, there were black people who were owning land, who did the, the businesses, but how those things, they were uh, destroyed and then their bodies, they were turned into labor, right? And let, let's look at the, the history of mining. So when I'm saying land, it's not farms. When I'm saying land, I, I want us to imagine this even to the cosmological level, it's everything. It's a totality of life and being dispossessed of this. It's a serious violation that no kind of legislation that stands today can understand it. That is why even the, the constitution that, that we are having is toothless when it comes to the issue of land because of we have the property clause, which I find ludicrous to a point where even the debates, things like uh, land without expropriation, I'm, I'm finding them scratching uh, the, the surface. We need a commission of inquiry, which I will call the Jan van Riebeck Commission of Inquiry. And this will need serious jurists, people who are going to understand law at the fundamental level. How pertinent is the issue of race in this book? And why does this topic offer such adversarial responses? The question of race is everything. It's a don't go area. There's a fear of having to engage the question of racism. But the significance in this book uh, in terms of racism is that people have been talking about racism in general terms. So in this country, even the racist perpetrators, they are now victims of racism. 
we we know like uh, the late FW did like uh, claims to be the victim of racism and bodies and uh, formations like your know, South African Human Rights uh, Commission they don't even understand what racism is and we see how powerful the liberal consensus is doing all that is in its might to destroy uh, anything that has to do with uh, the question of race because it's not an invention it's a reality that we are in and uh, what we have to confront and i don't believe in this scam of oh let's work together to emulate uh, racism no what i'm proposing is it's very simple we have to redefine racism i'm thinking about anti-black racism i want to be specific so to dislodge this liberal uh, consensus, which means, oh, we are all affected, let's find solutions. We don't need uh, solutions. We need to understand anti-black racism as a specific form of racism. And for there to be the end of racism, we don't need uh, white people to come and assist black people or, or support them. No, they must dislodge it. I'm very specific in terms of the infrastructure of racism because we know that uh, white people are supported by institutions in this country there are no institutions that support black people black people need to have the power to repossess the definition and the meaning of uh, racism and uh, when i'm saying even the issue of black pain i'm not meaning it in this performative sense oh black pain no this is something serious we go to the townships Every weekend, it's funerals. We have to question it. We go to hospitals. The mortality rates are so ridiculous. So we need to understand racism in terms of even structural levels. The book also seems to denounce the current iteration of the Constitution and the rule of law. Is this a fair characterization? And if so, what is the basis of this critique? I would say maybe like my critique is limited i would say maybe, maybe my critique is legit but let's start with the constitution the constitution of this country does not reflect the reality that we are in do you know that the constitution does not have three ways racism slavery and colonialism read it from the beginning to the end you won't find those, those three ways and then it tells us about the injustices of the past now if you look at this construction of the past, it is as if this past starts from 1948. Of course, when you come to the issue of land, it starts from 1913. But this country has a long history of slavery. The critique of the law and the constitution comes from the very fact that uh, they don't express the black point of view. And these are institutions that are supposed to reflect the matters of the polity. As I said, the, the polity it means the politically organized uh, community. That does the Roman Dash law. Of course, you have the customary law, but it is that thing of the chiefs there in the rural areas. It is not uh, looked in terms of it having an elevated juridical uh, status. And we know that the power of the judicial infrastructure in this country. And we must know that. Uh, slavery, colonialism, and uh, apartheid, they were based on law. They were legal systems. So I think that there is a forgetting that is being done that this anti-black racism was codified into law. Like, look at the hyper-legislations of apartheid. Study only the 20th century in terms of the legislations that, that, that were done against black people. So we cannot let the law uh, of the hook, even if like the, the, there might be issues of oh, juridical transformation and like we see like how even the concept law itself that it needs to be totally refigured so that it can speak to the reality that we are in. So in terms of the fair characterization, I would say that the fairness comes from having to understand the law from the black point of view. What has the law done to black people? We have townships because of the law. And now, the critique of the law that needs to, to be done is that we should not regard the law as that which is absolute. Because by this I mean there is this thing of uh, the law is the law, as if the law was not invented by human beings. So all these systems, they need to be studied anew. We cannot have a just polity if the law is not attended to, because for the polity to exist, it needs to be underpinned by law. But we need to ask, what kind of law? Uh, do we need and for this to happen as well 
we need a new jurisprudence. And I'm glad that there are people like who are doing uh, beautiful work. Uh, people like uh, Chuel Mudiri, Ndumiso Zaza, Mukhobe Ramose, and many others uh, who are pushing even the critiques of uh, the constitution. We need that. And I think that will start by not regarding the constitution as the most progressive in the world. A lot of work has to be done. And finally, what would you like readers to take away from your book? I'm not beyond criticism. They need to read the book slowly and carefully. And by this, I'm very serious like, uh, on this. Like, I didn't write a you know, fried steak kind of a book. Like, I did the oxtail, like, you know, slow cooking movement. And it's a book that is not there to shock. But it's a reality that uh, we are in. Like the, the, the things that I'm, I'm saying here, uh, I'm not the first one. I'm, I'm building on my predecessors, my contemporaries, and even in other parts uh, of the world. Because we need to understand that this is the high time that we need to attend to the stakes that we are in. And these stakes are very high. So this is a book that must be read with uh, fidelity and humility. That was author Tendai Sitole discussing his book, Black X, Liberatory Thought in Azania.